morning. I'm Sergio Lula from University of California, Riverside, uh, the Center for Environmental Research and Technology. Uh, we'll be talking about the um, deployment and development of a integrated microgrid incorporating solar and battery energy storage and EV charging. So the, well, the outline is introduction and uh, the test bed, we call it Sustainable Integrated Grid Initiative. And it's composed of solar PV, battery energy storage, EV chargers, and load. And zero net energy requirements in California buildings. And then uh, data acquisition and optimal controller and some results. The background is, uh, as we all know, that uh, in uh, some certain grids, the renewable energy generation is uh, rapidly increasing, uh, if not in the overall system, certain part of the system for sure. Solar and wind energy are intermittent and uh, may not be available when um, needed. It's not dispatchable. And that causes uh, grid integration issues. And California is facing some of those. And we'll quickly look at an overview and need for distribution level demonstration to convince very conservative electric utilities. They don't want to uh, just accept what university research or national lab researchers do. Uh, they want to see is deployed somewhere, preferably not in their system, in somebody else's system. And then they will accept it that, well, it works. And uh, in a larger scale, uh, the challenge of um, research center is that we can do it for a building. We do great in the lab setups. But it has to be in a distribution level where uh, uh, the utilities will be more convinced. So we have a system which is uh, at distribution level. And we'll talk about that a little bit. So California's um, the challenge of grid integration of renewable is uh, partly their aggressive goal uh, of, um, say, right now, 25%, uh, 30%, which uh, has been achieved. And then the future goal is 60% of, of the overall um, state grid by 2030 and 100% by 2045. Now, on top of this, uh, the UC system, University of California system with 10 campuses, they also have a more aggressive goal, which means to achieve some of these four or five years earlier. Uh, that's uh, kind of a voluntary campus goals. Now, during daytime, um, already California has sizable solar production. And uh, facing a challenge of the evening time when solar is gone, and uh, still the uh, building loads and industrial load is still there. And that creates a very rapid ramping requirement. And um, if we look at the, the top one here, this is a 2020, 2012 actual uh, load profile of March 31. And March 31 is, uh, March is a, a kind of a uh, between winter and summer, uh, the solar production increases uh, significantly during uh, spring, but the air conditioning load has not kicked in yet. So that's why the demand in the afternoon is not that great. So this is actual, 2013 is also actual, and uh, the difference between the two is mostly due to solar coming into the system. The challenge is in the evening, from this value to reach the rapidly increasing ramping needed to satisfy the characteristics there used to be, say, about 2,000 or 2,500 megawatt. But with the projection from that time, 2014, 2015, and uh, 2019 now, is reduction of the daytime demand due to increased solar production. So that's good. And how much has been achieved? I'll, I'll show that in a minute. But the challenge is that if solar production is gone around 5, 6 PM, and then the demand 
rapidly picks up. Now the ramp need is 13,000 megawatt. And that has to come from fossil fuel plants for now, or uh, potentially battery energy storage in the future. OK, so this, the challenge of that is that any, most of the efficient power plants are uh, boiler, steam boiler, whether it's nuclear reaction or uh, uh, natural gas burning or coal burning. And they cannot rapidly change their production. And typically, they're base load, and they do steady production. These are less efficient gas turbines and only needed for a few hours. Capital cost, capitalization becomes very expensive. So that's the technical challenge right now, depending on where you are. Now, what did happen in uh, 2019? Did we achieve? that much reduction, or is it less or more? What would be your guess? Now, in reality, the achievement was significantly higher than what was, what was only five, six years ago. Uh, looking back again, the reduction was estimated to be, the minimum would be around, say, 13,000 megawatt will be the minimum peak during daytime. This is opposite of traditional afternoon peak is used to be much higher because of the air conditioning load. So the minimum is 13,000 megawatt, and uh, midnight, 21,000 megawatt, and this peak is 26,000, say, around there. And you look at what has been achieved is the this peak around midnight and this one is about same. In fact, slightly reduction after about six, seven years. But this bottom is now only 7,000, 8,000 megawatt, as opposed to projection was 13,000. So they do achieve um, these uh, uh, tight targets because it's required by the state regulation, the state uh, California Public Utility Commissions. And, um, and also some incentive from US Department of Energy in solar and uh, large solar development, and also California incentives. So now we need this 13,500 megawatt in two and a half hours, and that's one challenge. This is why battery energy storage or any kind of electrical energy storage is really needed to help in this part also, and not reduce the demand during good solar production this low. If we can store part of the energy in any electrical form, this wouldn't be that low. It would be somewhat higher. And then ramping rate would be slightly lower. And then part of the peak would be provided by the stored energy. So this is on top of just the uh, time of use rate benefit of lower price, higher price. So California utilities are already convinced the utility commission that it's not the afternoon price in summer time is the highest price. Highest price should be in this evening peak, which is completely different from historic uh, practice of highest peak in summer time being mid uh, noon to 6 p.m. That's still in place in most of the uh, investor-owned utilities. So here is uh, our um, that test bed which is uh, uh, the sizes that are given there. In the solar, we have 180 kilowatt in one of the buildings, 500 kilowatt hour of battery and a trolley connected to that building. And then there's atmospheric processing lab has another 180 kilowatt solar and a trailer with 500 kilowatt hour of lithium batteries. And then the other building has 100 kilowatt trailer and stationary battery. So between the two is megawatt hour and then um, we are uh, able to um, uh, plug and play different components and do different uh, protocols and scenarios to demonstrate demand management, vehicle to grid, uh, and the net zero energy um, building demonstration. This is the overview of the system, the energy, uh, this Research center is this area with the 500 kilowatt of uh, uh, 
parking lot structure, uh, and then uh, a trolley, and multiple level two and level one level three charger, and here's the battery, one uh, megawatt hour of stationary battery. That part is the main campus, which is much bigger, 7.5 megawatt solar, and one megawatt hour of battery, and thermal energy storage, and of course, parking lots have many uh, electric vehicle chargers. So um, the, here are the pictures of the three microgrids, three different buildings. So the, those are the inverters for each of those buildings. And here is the stationary battery, lithium iron uh, battery. And this is uh, 500 kilowatt hour with 100 kilowatt of inverter. This is the electric trolley. And here is the trailer, which could be plugged in into multiple uh, different buildings by moving it around. It's 500 kilowatt hour, 100 kilowatt uh, batteries, same batteries as in stationary. Now, the California's other requirement um, is uh, zero net energy in um, all resin residential buildings, new construction by next year, 2020, and then all commercial new construction by 2030. So on site, you have to produce enough energy to cover your 24-hour need, which essentially means much larger uh, photovoltaic to export power during the daytime and bring power back from the grid at nighttime. And we'll show a little bit of results there. And then um, all the buildings which have major renovations have to have, 50% of them have to have uh, this net zero capability. And that's a state law. Here is some results from um, net zero building implementation in one of the buildings. This is the solar production going up and capped by the capacity of the inverter. Afternoon, there is some clouds and uh, higher and lower production. Nighttime, no production. And then next day. This is net coming from the grid. So around 20 kilowatt for that building from midnight to uh, solar production time. Solar production is significantly higher than building uh, need by design. So it's exporting power during these times. And then when solar production is uh, gone, then again import from the grid. So, so green one is the solar production, and this blue one is the uh, meter reading uh, from the grid. These big spikes are due to level three charger, which is 480 volt, uh, 50 kilowatt charger. So these jumps are approximately 50 kilowatt. Now one problem we are facing is that during the daytime, higher demand due to charging, that's what happened here, is being covered by surplus solar production. But nighttime, there's no solar production, so the grid is already providing 20 kilowatt and then another 50 kilowatt jump. So this is now our maximum demand, which was not really traditionally true. Traditionally, it was always the daytime higher use of the building plus this big demand. Okay. Um, so that same building, this is before we added solar as part of this project. This was monthly uh, kilowatt hour use and uh, summertime highest. Then after adding solar and making it net uh, zero uh, building, these are the net in the electric bills. Sometimes a little bit uh, overproduction net in a month. This is uh, underproduction and so on. So that's how, uh, going back to the net zero, is that this part of export has to be equal or higher than this part of the import. That's what is net zero building. And that is only possible if you have net metering. But larger solar projects don't have net metering. They have to have generation interconnection uh, complicated contract. This is by law. Uh, the buildings have this right. OK, so the green ones are extra energy use due to chargers being added to that building. So this is passed through. It's, uh, uh, the power comes from the grid and goes to the charge vehicles. So this is, on the main campus, we have large solar thermal energy storage for um, uh, when surplus solar production is there. This is thermal energy stored or off-peak. And 
So there was this heat wave in July 23, 2018. The power company needed help in shifting the peak from 8 p.m., which our normal 21 megawatt peak, to this uh, after 9 p.m. And uh, we did that by running it during on-peak time to store extra uh, cold water for circulating later on. And you could see the shift from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m., same type of peak. So this was uh, a 61% uh, reduction in the peak during the di uh, difficult time of the electric uh, grid. And same type of thing we did earlier on the building only. And this, this is the research center. And before the action, 225 kilowatt was imported from the grid, which is this value. And then uh, this was the 100 kilowatt ba uh, battery charging going on. We start battery charging and then um, started exporting from the battery. This is the 100 kilowatt export. This is the solar production going down with time. And overall, this use 225 input it became 95 export just from one building with some battery energy storage and, uh, and using solar. So with those benefits to the electric utilities, they're very interested in, in cooperating and, and trying to see how they can scale it up. Uh, unless you could uh, demonstrate that to them, they kind of think that we only can do it on lab benches with tiny load and tiny batteries and in real size, like 100 kilowatt and uh, 225 kilowatt and so on, that that type of size is uh, what they need to feel comfortable. So that's, hmm. Um, for the, for the detail of the duck car in the afternoon when you have so much power, why don't you generate um, hydrogen and then uh, use the fuel cell later in the day? And you already have a gas turbine, you mentioned. So combine the fuel cell with gas turbine, like solid oxide fuel cell with a high temperature, then you can uh, run with a 60% efficient system. Otherwise, gas turbine is only 30% efficient. If combined with fuel cell, it would be more than 60%. Then you can take care of the debt problem. Have you thought about Maybe you must have thought. I just want to know. Yeah, whether well, it's hydrogen as energy storage, electrical energy storage by producing hydrogen, or um, battery energy storage, or compressed air storage in, in salt caverns, the, uh, is all doable if somebody is going to sponsor that part of the project and the cost and so on. So the, those have been deployed and uh, uh, demonstrated in isolated way, including batteries. Here, our aim was to integrate different things. And the main sponsor of the project was South Coast Air Quality Management District. They wanted to show that solar electricity can drive transportation if we use batteries in between to store. And that was uh, one of the main uh, uh, driver of this project. Have you looked at the economics specifically with the demand chart in California was contributed? Yes, yes, yeah. With the most of the activities, the ones I showed in real uh, was to help the power company help the summer maximum demand time. So there we had to throw the time of use rates. In fact, it cost us money to run it and, and show it that we could do it. But our normal operation is off peak charging or surplus solar time charging, and then delivering battery power during the uh, high demand, high cost time. And we reduced in one building 212 kilowatt demand on peak to only 12 kilowatt for a whole month, month after month, and it's reflecting the electric bill. Then um, uh, the, that was on peak, but off peak went up because that's when we are charging battery. Um, on the net zero energy building requirement, what's the uh, accounting period? Is it every day or every month? No, it's over the year. Because uh, with solar, you will produce more during, um, not really summertime. You actually produce more during um, spring and, uh, and fall when it's cooler. 
and even the sunlight is not as long. Summertime, the efficiency is somewhat less, plus um, the building use is higher. So it's a year-round accounting. So they, they have separate meter to account for export and import, and you balance out over the year. That's the net zero definition for the commercial and, and residential buildings. Question. Yeah, following up uh, this discussion on uh, net zero buildings, uh, so in Europe we are used to, uh, uh, to define it uh, including several energy services, not only the electricity related services, but heating and cooling, uh, and uh, in addition also a certain uh, building uh, standard, the code has to be fulfilled uh, in terms of uh, heat load, so the 30 kilowatt hours per square meter and year. Uh, so is this also in California discussion? No, no. no, California and, and overall U.S. is only on electric utilities, all the pressure and everything, because the gas and um, most of the gas utilities are also connected with uh, liquid fuel people. So there is no requirement like that. Although gas utilities uh, encourage some uh, energy saving uh, rebates and so on, there's no requirement. Because in that sense, then you could uh, argue you are a plus energy, uh, that's a building if you have a high uh, standard uh, implemented. Yeah, that's right. And, and so gas uh, has to be included because it's a significant component of, of uh, energy use in buildings. And that may be coming in future, but right now not stir. Mm.